Brett McKay here, and welcome to another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. Well, we all want to be successful in our lives, and it's not just economically successful, but we want to be successful in our personal lives, our family lives, our fitness, our community service, church service, whatever. And our guest today argues that success is a skill that can be acquired through practice. His name is Dr. Jeff Spencer, and he's coached world-class athletes, including Olympians. He's also a former Olympian himself, as well as CEOs. And today on the podcast, Dr. Jeff Spencer and I discuss his program called The Champion's Blueprint. We discuss the science of success, the mindset you need to develop, the systems you need to put in place, the teams of people you need around you in order to be your best self. Even if you're not a high-level CEO, how you can apply this for the average Joe. It's a really fascinating discussion with lots of practical takeaways. I think you're going to like it. So let's do this. Dr. Jeff Spencer. Dr. Jeff Spencer, welcome to the show. It is such a pleasure. I can't thank you enough for the privilege. So tell us, how did you wind up doing what you do? Because it's a unique thing. You, you basically coach success to Olympians, professional athletes, CEOs. How do you wind up doing that? Well, it's uh, sort of interesting. Number one, uh, the path was through a uh, very interesting background where my dad was an artistic genius uh, and he died homeless on the streets of New York City. So I realized that talent and will and technique and technology are never going to save anybody. So that is certainly a requirement, but that's not the answer. I also realized when I was a kid that wanted to be an Olympian that the biggest and the baddest didn't win. It was always the people on paper that shouldn't that did. And I was curious about that. Then when I had my mentors come into my life, uh, once my uh, dad had uh, abandoned the family, they shared with me all their secrets on how they became iconic in their industries. And I realized, well, it's not the industry. It's about them and it's about how they show up because they don't have the best pedigree, but yet they're always first in line to grab the brass ring. Where all the people with the best pedigrees are still scratching their head when these guys have already grabbed the brass ring and moved on. And so... As a result of that, um, I did become an Olympian. So I know what it's like to compete at the top. And unless you've been there, you can't possibly understand it. And you cannot go out and study successful people and necessarily help people become one. You have to have lived that experience itself. I also uh, was successful um, almost as a scientist, uh, as a, I have a master's degree in uh, uh, exercise uh, physiology. So I really understand the body. I know what it takes to get to the top. I understand what's required to have the physical resources to be able to make your dreams come true, whether that's in the locker room or the boardroom, it doesn't matter. You've got to really have physical capacity. And as a result of that, I had people come to me that were very interested in how do I get to the top of my game, but how do I finish that off by staying there and creating a long and lasting legacy of contribution and meaning. So I got asked a lot of other questions about health and fitness, injury prevention, injury management, uh, so on and so forth. So I went back and I became a chiropractor. I was International Sports Chiropractor of the Year. So I really became that go-to guy that could look at the entire universe of an individual and dissect it and see what had to happen to be able to move them forward into their greatness and their greatest leverage. And what the discovery really was is that the people that had the readiness for the pivotal moments there are maybe three or four or five pivotal moments that occur each year that will determine the success or the failure of a person's business and of their life. And so I observed that. And because I had a background in basically everything, I wasn't really a coach. You know, a coach is someone that helps you on a specific item or a slice of the pie to be applied at some point later. Um, that's not what I did. And it's like I wasn't really a mentor. I didn't hold people's hands down the path to the promised land. But because I was very successful in five or six different areas, I take people in any area to get to the top of their game and stay there. So really what I do is more of a corner man type of feature where there's nothing that you can't talk to me about because I understand just about everything. And I can take your universe and I can dissect exactly what the path is. So you have the readiness to be able to convert those opportunities and carry momentum forward to your bigger and your greater future. Interesting. So interesting. Right there. Okay. So you started off in sports. How did you get with like CEOs? Did they come to you? Was that something yeah. like, yeah, okay. I did. I did. Well, because their deal is, okay, well, you're an Olympian, so you must know something about getting to the top, which, which you're absolutely correct. I mean, even though it was sports, sports was the technical side of it. Business has a technical business side to it, right? But what about the CEO? It's like, how do you show up in leadership? How do you guide a team to a bigger future? That's all about you. It's exactly the same thing in sport as it is in stage, 
as it is in the boardroom. It's exactly the same thing. So it was a very easy transition. Okay. So you argue in um, your book, uh, Turn It Up, and you say that success is a skill. It is. That absolutely. anyone can learn. So That's if right. su- success is a skill, what are the practices that make up that skill? And how does one become skilled in success? Well, let's sort of define what uh, a champion is, first and foremost, whether that's in business sport or whatever, someone that can consistently deliver on the promise of their skill and their talent and a bigger, better and vital future and contribution to other people. So if I look at that level of definition, that's someone that has the readiness for the pivotal moments to be able to achieve their champion goals and avoid preventable problems. That's a big deal. You got to be able to avoid preventable problems without losing time and momentum. So that being said, having the success that I did with people, sports, business, boardroom, locker room, on stage, off stage, it doesn't matter to me. I looked at having done this for 40 years, like what is the common thread that they all share? And I recognized, because I actually drew what it looked like on a napkin in a restaurant, and there were eight different steps that every prolific performer goes through without exception. There are no exemptions that develop the capacity to be able to develop that readiness for those pivotal moments that carry momentum forward to the bigger future. There are eight very specific steps that every performer goes through. Is this your champion's blueprint then? It is. Yes. That's the champion's blueprint. So what are those, those steps? Well, step number one is legacy. It's important to have a broader context for what it is that you are ultimately going to achieve and what you are actually are going to leave as an individual. I always think it's important to, lead with the end in mind. And it's like, if you have a legacy statement, then you have a context that keeps you in integrity and keeps your decision-making in integrity to make sure that you're moving towards the future and the legacy that you want to leave. Most people don't do that. Most people start and they begin the process of pursuing a goal with the idea of getting to the top. And the top is really in the champion blueprint, not the finish line. The top is actually at nine o'clock. There are two steps above top. There's master, And then there's also champion. That's step one. Step number two is vision. Uh, A vision is not a goal. A goal is, again, getting to the top, a destination. Vision is really how do you see yourself once you achieve your goal? What does that do to you? What is the level of credibility? What is the value that you have in your belief? How is it that you call other people to a higher game through the achievement of that goal? And the reason why vision is important is that it uh, gives you the clarity to be very uh, clear and have a very well-defined purpose for which you get up and commit to each and every day. Step number three is mindset. I'm not talking about positive thinking. I'm not talking about a perfect GRE or 180 degree or 180 uh, IQ. I'm talking about do you really have the knowledge and do you really understand and do you have the fortitude to be able to engage all of the challenges and the processes that you will engage in route to being able to achieve your goal. Do you really have that? Do you set? Do you have a set of standards that you call everybody to that you run your major? You you run your process against. You got to have that mindset. If you don't have a mindset, you don't have a legacy. You don't have a vision. Don't start because you're not ready. Because what that does that creates an emotive force that makes actually the ambition to get to the goal the goal actually alive in in in, in real. Uh, Step number uh, four is um, inventory. And before anybody begins, before you've got any skin in the game, make sure that you have a vetted inventory of skills and knowledge that you must have as an individual in leadership. And you must also have a vetted list of material resources, time, space, uh, equipment, team, et cetera, before you go live boots on the ground. And if you go through those four steps, then you're ready to go into division two of the champion blueprint, which is the performance side where you're actually kind of opening the doors and actively pursuing your goal. Step number five is climb the wall. And when I talk about climb the wall, this is uh, where you're actually developing the perseverance and you're developing the critical mass to be able to have your first breakout performance where you perform for the first time in line with your expectation. It's very similar to Malcolm Gladwell's 10,000 hours to develop the capacity to perform at the level consistent with your goal. Now, once you've had your breakout performance that confirms to you and everybody else, hey, I can actually do this, then you have to duplicate that so you own the technical process. And that's step six, which is called elevation. And this is where you own your product, you can reproduce it, it, you will never, ever not get it right. And once you are performing at that level, 
then you're at the best of the best in your discipline or in line with your expectation, then that begins step number seven, which is adaptation. Because once you achieve your goal, particularly at a very high level, once you get to the top, you inherit a whole other set of challenges beyond your technical skill. And those have to do with external forces that will significantly challenge you. People, places, and things, they're gonna come after you because you got a target on your back. And if you're not ready for the acceleration of responsibility at that level, then there's no way that you can run at the top indefinitely. It absolutely is not gonna happen. So when you have developed a system and the skill to be able to deal with the external circumstances that can take you out of the game and you match that with your technical skill, then you've achieved mastery. You really get the idea of what it really takes to perform at that level. The perfect example is you too. Those guys can cut a platinum album just as easily as making another piece of bread or toast. That's because they've mastered the process. Now, if you've mastered the process, then you have step number eight. Step number eight is the wave. The wave is where you can pick and choose your ambitions. This is where you have discretionary income. This is where you have mastered the process of creation. And this is where you can add the most significant number and magnitude of successes to your legacy. But there's a problem, and this is a big problem, because generally people defer health and relationships along the process to get to the promised land. And that's where the balloon payment has got to be paid back in terms of the health that's been deferred and, and where relationships have been deferred. I have seen many people, once they got it figured out, they have a catastrophic uh, uh, relationship failure or they have a catastrophic preventable health issue because they deferred that process. If you survive that, then you have to survive the success intoxication. Most people aren't ready for that. The temptations that you get once you're at the top are significant. And I've seen people that can't manage that through a lifetime of preparation and achievement away in an instant by doing some preventable amateurish decision that basically takes them out of the game. And if you've learned all of those skills in that eight steps, then you have the capacity to be able to create the greatest legacy of distinction and be able to create the most uh, valued life and the, the lifestyle that you have as aspired to achieve. There's a lot of great stuff there. I want to unpack a little things that stuck out to me. I love the idea of have, focusing on vision rather than goals. Um, yes. Because in my experience, like, you know, having goals is great, but then the problem you run into is that you achieve a goal and you think when you set the goal that when you achieve it, that you'll feel satisfied and you'll feel happy. And then you, you get there and you're just sort of like, okay. You, you know, that, that's so classic that you would say that because actually getting to the top is actually a false summit because Hollywood tells you that when you arrive there, then you will be enriched and nourished. You'll fill the void, the vacuum that you've been striving so diligently for and it never delivers because the magnitude of the challenges once you get there, you couldn't conceive of it in advance. And the problem is, is that if you don't know that it's coming and you can't run your blind spots, that's the thing that could take you out of the game. So you're absolutely right. Yeah. Like here's an ex experience from my own life. So I, I went to law school and my, my goal, my first semester is like, I want to be number one in my class. Like that was the thing, number one. And so yeah. I, I worked I had a system, I got it down to that. And I, when the grades came out and they, you had to go to the front desk and they handed you a slip of paper and it had your, they wrote the lady at the office, wrote your rank on it. And I got it and it said one. And I, I thought I'd be really elated, but I remember just sort of, I remember the feeling was like, it was sort of kind of a letdown like, <laughs> of how I felt. Cause uh, I don't know, it was just really bizarre. And then I had to like readjust uh, yeah. my sort of my, my expectations about things. And so, yeah, I had to have like a bigger vision. Like, okay, why am I doing this? Like, why am I working? So is it just for that number or is it, there's some bigger purpose? Well, that's what the legacy is all about. That's why if you establish that up front, then you could decide on your current trajectory, whether that's the way, whether that's the way your race is going to end or not. And so really without that integrity filter, then by default, your passion is to get to the top often at all costs and people sometimes leave a trail of destruction 10 miles long behind that never deliver. But man, did they get to the top, correct? Yeah. Well, my, oh. the terrible discussion, I, my health went down. I, I was surviving on protein bars and diet Mountain Dew. It's classic. <laughs> classic. I, don't, I don't recommend. It's classic. Okay. So uh, be vision or and have a, have a bigger vision and don't, don't be so goal oriented. That, you, you brought up an interesting point about... Um, some of the stuff that comes with success. A lot of people, they, they focus on the positive of success. Like, oh, I'll have, 
you know, all these opportunities opened up to me, uh, people will recognize me, I'll have money, et cetera, et cetera. But there are some pitfalls to success. Um, and some of those things could kind of make people afraid of success. Uh, what are the the things, how, how can someone be afraid of success? You talk about this in your book, Turn It Up. Yeah, well, the, the responsibility of success, because once you've achieved it, then the expectation is that that's now going to be your new normal. And people have an idea and sense of what time and effort it took to be able to get there. And now I've got to keep that as my normal, not in addition to the expectation to be able to exceed that by raising my bar. That can be extremely intimidating to people. And quite honestly, uh, the reason why it's intimidating is that they don't have a plan or a strategy to be able to engage that because they don't understand that that's coming. So like, for example, in the Champions Blueprint, since each of the steps is progressive, you not only know where you are and you not only know what to do in that step to carry momentum forward, but you also know the next step and you know what's coming. So you're ready for the brass ring and you're also ready for the pothole. So you always know what's coming. You're never taken by surprise. And in my experience, the punch that everybody should fear in business and in sport and on stage is the punch that they don't see that's coming. And without a plan, you're guessing. And the conventional model is dream really big, want it bad enough, work hard, you're going to close the gap. And that's not true. I know a lot of people that try really hard that basically go nowhere. And so really in the champion blueprint, the void or the empty space that can be closed by a better plan, almost by default, the plan can close it. And that's really not what history tells us. That's a sacred space that has to be managed. You know, the plan and the conventional work hard and want it bad enough, that's like a GPS. You have a destination, you got a starting point, and then a voice tells you where to go while you watch the picture. Great idea, but what it doesn't show you is the live traffic patterns. It does not show you the weather. It does not show you the perspective from the local that says, why don't you take this shortcut rather than what it says on the map. I know what it says, but that's not right. So unless you can manage that space to be able to take your plan and implement it and move it forward progressively, unless there's a vessel to hold that responsibly to negotiate that minefield, the likelihood of being able to achieve a life of distinction and getting to your bigger goals, in my view, is almost nil. So the champion's blueprint doesn't take the place of a big vision, doesn't take the place of working hard and wanting that enough. It's about protecting and preserving the path to make sure that you can negotiate and advance the initiative by carrying momentum from where you are to where you want to go. Here's something I'm curious about, and you probably have some insight into this because you were an Olympian. So, you know, if success is the new normal, right? How does an Olympian, for example, or a high performance athlete adjust to life after their career? Right. Cause like, well, yeah, I can understand. I mean, I can only speak for myself. It's like when I came back from the Olympics, I can understand why astronauts go to the moon and they come back and they're bent because you can't look at anything else the same again. It's just, it, it, it skews your vision of what's possible and it skews your normal. Like mediocrity is like not acceptable. Correct because you really understand what's possible and you understand what it takes to get there. So again, you can't go back to a normal that once was, it's now irrelevant. You can't conceive of it. So again, you, you make choices in a different way. You place a different value on things because many of the things, quite honestly, that we look at that are the mantras of what it should be when we get there are complete myths. And many of the mechanisms and uh, promises that we followed to get to where we want to go, they're hollow. It's like working hard doesn't close the gap. Wanting it bad enough doesn't get you to where you want to go. You, you cannot get somewhere that the level of skill that you have will not enable. So there's another reality there. And that's one of the reasons why performing at the highest level is extremely challenging because um, you're facing and asking uh, a different set of questions that not everybody understands, but yet it's proven itself to be the mechanism to carry you to the extraordinary where that becomes your normal rather than the exception. It actually becomes your normal. And it's not an accident. It's a skill that's learned and it's a skill that's maintained by its application. Interesting. So you mentioned uh, that there's a point in that adaptation phase where uh, it's you've come to that point where you start making mistakes where it's possible to start making mistakes yeah. um, that can just ruin everything that you build. Are there any examples that stick out to you of yeah, highly absolutely. successful people that threw it all away because of just really dumb mistakes? Yeah. Okay. Well, so let's look at Lance Armstrong, for example, right? Right. It's like he had the world. He was the man. Great story. Amazing achievement. Correct. Mm -hmm. But his legacy is probably about as low as it can get. And can he get it back? I don't know the answer to that yet. But the point I want to make is that, 
perhaps if Lance had had a filter of integrity to look at and make decisions against while he was going through the process to the promised land that he had defined in advance, he may not have made the choices that he did. I mean, that's an obvious chance. Same thing with Tiger Woods, you know, and, and I've worked with both of these guys, not in this capacity, but I spent time with them. And so again, most of these things really, if we look at it, dreams to me are predictable. If you hold a dream in a certain reality, they're predictable as are nightmares. But unless we can locate where someone is in their process, and that's what the Champion Blueprint's all about, is that we can locate where you are, then we know it's coming, so there aren't no surprises, and we can peek around the corner. Then you're playing roulette with your life, basically. I look at Lance. I look at Tiger. I look at the mistakes that people predictably make, that people say it's normal. No, it's not normal. This is a, perp this is a person that does not have the readiness for what history tells us is a very high probability. And unless we have that readiness, then we're doomed to repeat, we're, we're doomed to repeat history. There's no way that you can make it. It's not possible. Yeah, I guess when you, you reach that level of success, you have a lot more to lose, right? I mean, it, so the, the fall is a lot harder. Well, you do. And that's one of the reasons why you need advisors. And you can have coaches that will show you technical skills to keep you moving forward from a specialist perspective in one slice of the pie. You can also have a mentor that can, again, hold your hand down the path to the promised land. But where's the oversight of everything that includes your personal life and everything else that could take you out of the game. I mean, that's, that's a corner man's issue. Yeah. And that's why I said the corner man is absolutely the rarest, most difficult of all of the advisory species because they have to be so well-versed in everything to be able to see the complete picture, to be able to make really good judgments about what the benefit to risks are of anything being considered. So yeah, let's go. That, that's kind of an interesting point of like sort of having a team, right? And you, you emphasize in today's, I guess, comp you know, competitive landscape, uh, mm -hmm. you, you can't do, you can't become successful on your own. It requires a team around you. And I think we can understand that that's the case for world-class athletes. You know, they have dietitians, trainers, uh, sure. psychologists, individuals like you, CEOs, same thing. They have all, but what's it look like for the average Joe who's, who wants to go to a better place in his life, right? But he has a corporate job, family. Um, same. what is that? So what, what would a team look like for him? Well, there's actually two teams. You need a personal team and you also need a professional team. So if we look at kind of the requirements uh, in the personal team, you obviously need a tribe. You need a group of people that you fellowship with on a regular basis that share a level of common value and same altitude. These are people that understand us. We need that engagement to be able to get meaningful feedback from and, and counsel from. You need that. You, uh, you also need a wingman. You need somebody that's always there watching your back uh, 24 hours a day. You can always call uh, rain or shine, sleet or snow. They're always there to watch your back. you got to have a wingman or two. Uh, you've got to have a cornerman. A cornerman is actually a bridge between your personal and your professional team because he's kind of an expert in everything, and he sees both uh, sides of the aisle, and he can advise as to the integration of this and how to move forward with everything, basically. So the cornerman, in my view, really becomes the key link. You also need a family. Uh, you need people to be responsible to that will call you to a higher game and perhaps take you someplace you're not even going to go yourself. So we need that. And in terms of the uh, performance team, uh, you've got to have a management team for sure. You've got to have your technicians. You've got to have your advisors. Uh, those are the critical elements. And when all of those are in symmetry, then you have a system that has massive coherence where the output is always greater than the sum of the parts. And in my experience, no one wins alone. It's not possible. Yeah. It's yeah. been my experience not too. Not possible. Um, so we've been talking really big picture. I'm curious if you have any like daily practices that do. everyone could take part in, you know, starting now yeah. that can help them achieve optimal success. Yeah. I would say that, you know, the most prized commodity like right now is to make sure that you can carry momentum and you don't get deflected or you don't get stalled either from too many people, places and things, too many obligations, or maybe you're indecisive. You know, those are all reasons why we stall. The, the risk of a stall is you may never get back the momentum. You may just drift into oblivion, which I find uh, abhorrent. So I think uh, a couple of things are, are, are really critical. Every morning uh, when you get up, I think it's important to do some level of meditative art where you're consciously uh, committing and putting on the armor to successfully engage people, places, and things so that you start the day from a position of mental and physical strength so that you can make your decision. So at the end of the day, it's a product of your vision. You don't make everybody else's emergency your problem. So there's got to be some contemplation, whether it's traditional 
a meditation, maybe it's Qigong yoga or whatever, maybe it's prayer. You decide what that is, but there's got to be a pause where you're really connecting with yourself and your soul and your body to be able to start the day from an integrated uh, perspective where you're not vulnerable to people, places, and things. Uh, number two, um, for sure, good nutrition because the body and the mind need good nutrition to run on and to be able to handle the physical and mental strain of the day because it just takes one mental lapse or drop in energy to create a catastrophic uh, amateurish preventable mental error. Uh, we also need um, a connection with purpose. For example, before I go to work each day, I look at a picture, you know, and the picture that I look at is that I look at a picture of myself and my wife, <laughs> and I also look at a picture of my adopted daughter. And what this does, this reminds me of why I go to work every day. It's a purpose outside myself that's bigger for me. And there's always enough energy to do anything on behalf of others. The other thing that I always do before I go to work and engage people, I decide how I'm going to show up that day. Am I going to show up and be of service to people? Or am I going to take things that may go wrong for me and make everybody pay for the things that aren't going right in my life? You know, I don't do that. You know, I make a very deliberate choice that I'm going to show up from the highest level of service to be able to call people to a higher game and give them the structure and the strategy to be able to do the next couple of steps to be able to move that ball forward down towards the end zone, to towards the end zone. And it's a conscious choice that I make every day. So you're, you're very intentional with your days. 100% only because I know that my legacy is dependent upon uh, what I did with my time and what I did with my talent in every moment that I waste is a trespass against that. Yeah. All right. Well, Jeff, where can people learn more about your work in the, the champions blueprint? Uh, two places actually. And, and thanks again for asking uh, my website, of course, which is www.drjeffspencer.com. And for those that are interested in the workshop, it would be www.drjeffspencer.com forward slash workshop workshop. All right, Jeff Spencer, thank you, for, uh, thank you so much for your time. It's been a pleasure. I can't believe that our time's up. Best of luck to everybody onward and all, upward. There's always room at the top for the best. Thanks again for just a delightful time. Thanks, Jeff. Our guest today was Dr. Jeff Spencer. He's the author of Turn It Up and also the creator of the Champions Blueprint. And you can find out more information about the Champions Blueprint program at drjeffspencer.com. <laughs> Well, that wraps up another edition of the Art of Manliness podcast. For more manly tips and advice, make sure to check out the Art of Manliness website at artofmanliness.com. And if you enjoy this podcast, I'd really appreciate if you would tell your friends about it. Give us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, SoundCloud, whatever it is you use to listen to the podcast. That will help us out in spreading the word. Till next time, this is Brett McKay telling you to stay manly.